everyone, welcome to Unapologetically You. And if you're watching this on YouTube, you've probably noticed I'm not on video, but for everyone, this is a special continuation for the end of season four, where we will be doing chapters from my book. So thank you so much for joining. Welcome to chapter one of Happiness Within, a journey of reflection and self-discovery by me, Tulsi Fasani. If you wish to purchase this book, it is currently available as an ebook, hardback, and paperback on Amazon. Chapter one, authentically you. Once you open the door to live a life where you are authentic to who you are and meant to be, you won't need to look back. I've always been my worst critic. Does this sound familiar to you? Is being self-critical something you tell yourself or maybe it is a term you use often when describing who you are to your friends and colleagues? Perhaps you have purposely explained why you are tough on yourself. Demand more of yourself when it comes to work, family or projects you undertake. There are times when some people want to showcase how hard they are on themselves. Some people acknowledge it is an underlying bravado perhaps to let people know something about them and their characteristic. For others, it is a gateway to openly criticizing themselves. On occasion, it can be used in the premise of being more thoughtful or self-aware, but often it seems like it is conditioned into us that to be successful, we need to be highly critical of ourselves or own this formidable character trait. For some, this term may be considered an admirable quality, which they like to associate themselves with. Being self-critical is easy for many, particularly in people who tend to overthink. I previously thought being self-critical showcased my work ethic and my need to constantly strive for better. However, I have come to understand that this was detrimental to my well-being. For me, being self-critical was working without boundaries and appeasing people sitting in the same negative bubble. I sought to be and do everything for everyone, only realizing almost too late that it was not sustainable. I would be pulling myself apart to please others, reach above and beyond other people's expectations, and countless times there would be no acknowledgement regarding the effort I put in. Where was the return for being this self-critical in myself and my work? This habit had become ingrained in me and it became a standard way of working. Constantly try striving for more, never feeling good enough or worthy enough left me feeling unappreciated and led to increasing self-criticism. It was only through the commitment to my spiritual practice that I became aware of the complete lack of boundaries placed for myself or others. Self-criticism became a detriment to my health and it was my responsibility to identify and omit critique from my daily life. I needed to flip this harsh inner critic on its head to express more self-compassion to myself in order to strengthen my positive traits while still staying true to who I was. Look after yourself. This is not an easy, this is not to say <laughs> thinking one way and then thinking another came as easily as flipping a light switch. It was more like dismantling the socket wiring, changing the internal distribution and reassembling to get the best of the energy I was using. This type of work wasn't a quick fix either. Throughout my early adult life, I'd experienced panic, panic attacks and periods of depression during times when I never really understood the terminology. People who didn't know me thought I was fine and functioning well, but thank goodness my close friends saw me differently. It was a few years ago on a gorgeous summer's weekend in June. It was the day after a late night concert in London and my friends had stayed the night at my apartment. We were all tired, but I was feeling exceptionally exhausted. I presumed it was from the lack of sleep from the night before, as well as recovering from a long working week. My friends observed me depleted on the sofa. They too were tired, but they noticed it was not in my nature to look or act this way. It was at that moment my friend had said a shocking statement that raised the alarm bells in my head. 
If you continue this path, it will lead to self-destruction and you will eventually suffer a breakdown. I've been there and you are headed in that right direction unless you stop it now. A friend gave me this advice since she had experienced exhaustion herself. She spoke about her familiarity with burnout and that for her it had it had been too late to recognise. No one gave her the early warning to halt the brakes on her self-destruction and she struggled for months to recoup from the after effects of her breakdown. The, tro the toll it took on her mental and physical health was completely overwhelming and all-consuming. Two things came to mind as she spoke. The first was that I had no idea this had happened to her. And the second was, I remember thinking this was the first time I heard her speak this way. Her tone was harsh, with an undertone of desperation, that maybe her suffering would not have been in vain. That if she could warn and support someone else through her cruel life lesson. When she warned me in this manner, I was dumbfounded, and at the time I was unable to respond. I did not think my levels of exhaustion were a big deal. I excused it as being tired. As they left for the drive back to Cardiff, I was reminded under no circumstances was I to go outside. You need to understand that I'm a moth to a flame when it comes to outdoors and sunshine. There is something about the fresh air, the touch of sunlight on my skin that fills up my batteries no matter how I am feeling. Nature is my key to rejuvenation. It is my re-energizer. As I looked outside desperate to venture out, fearing I would be missing out on the day if I did not, my friend's warning persisted. Open the French doors. Let the air in, but take today to relax. Despite feeling annoyed by my given instructor instructions on what to do, mentally I gave in. Fighting against their request and battling with my body was one fight I simply did not have left in me, so I stayed indoors. My friend's warning rang clear through my head for days after that I needed to start taking care of myself. This disconnect between how I thought I was feeling and actually listening to my body was completely against who I was as a performance coach. For far too long, the media influenced people and even athletes to keep pushing, ignore the pain, but slowly this narrative is changing. I had experienced anxiety and depression within various moments in my life and my friend's warning made me aware that I was ignoring what my body was trying to tell me. Feeling the need to be busy all the time is a trauma response and fear-based distraction from what you'd be forced to acknowledge and feel if you slowed down. Do you ever have a feeling when you are in a situation or meet someone and your gut intuitively tells you something is not right? Why do we often dismiss this, especially when later we find we were right all along? If only we listened to our body and intuition from the beginning, it may have saved us a lot of time, energy and potential heartache. I had unwittingly created a separation between trusting myself, my decisions and my gut. And I had become withdrawn from my authentic connection. I had gotten to the point where I felt I could no longer trust myself, particularly when it led me to a series of bad relationships. I mistrusted my intuition and allowed my negative thoughts and anxious feelings to distract me from the true instinctive signs I was blatantly ignoring. I realised those moments of heartache and pain did not happen in absence of good intuition, but because I had chosen not to listen to or trust it. My deluded mindset and disconnect meant I could not see the wood from the trees. I understood my immediate attention required me to refocus and be present. I was familiar with my soundtrack, which I played repeatedly like a popular song over the radio. I would recall memories from my past or race th through thoughts about potential outcomes in the future. Once I set the intention to focus on the present moment, to gain clarity and peace within my thoughts, that was the beginning of my incredible journey, but little did I know how long this would take. It's about the journey, never the destination, by Simon Rattle. Worry cannot add a single hour to our lives, 
Research shows that focusing on the past can have mental health benefits because you are condemned to repeat the past if you cannot remember it. A reason why people in the West are more focused on the present is because they are focused on themselves. Independence means they are not as concerned about how their present behavior will affect past or future relationships. Consequently, extreme focus on self-narcissism can result in depression for oneself and for others. As weeks rolled by, despite being less physically fatigued, I could feel an internal struggle envelope me. It caused me to feel tightness around my chest and I struggled to understand why there was this overwhelming feeling of unhappiness. I was in an industry I loved, I liked my job, yet something was amiss. I sensed this inner conflict, but I was unable to pin down where it originated from until a serendipitous moment struck a chord with me towards my soul's pathway. It was another glorious summer day, rays of sunshine filtered through my apartment, lighting up the living room where I practiced yoga and meditation, when suddenly something caught my attention. A video had popped up as a recommended watch list. It was from Gabrielle Bernstein's The Universe Has Your Back. I had this old sensation return. It was a trigger from my gut, that intuitive feeling that I had since become unfamiliar with. This trigger urged me to watch it, much like a gravitational pull circling my orbit. Since I made it an intention to nurture and listen to my intuition and gut reactions, I pressed play on the remote and it was life altering. This is something I can only describe as an aha moment, a notion popularized by Oprah Winfrey on her talk show. This shook me into a moment of clarity and awakening, and it was when the penny finally dropped. Gabrielle spoke about her work and personal evolution. Whilst I watched her story unfold, my immediate judgment was how she was so poised and beautiful. It was a false assumption that she seemed to have everything in her life under control, but her story, she described her struggle in detail. Gabrielle's words truly resonated with me. She was not perfect and she didn't have everything under control. Her internal battle was our familiar battle. She placed her vulnerability out into the audience by describing ways she would control every aspect of her life within a given timeline. As an individual who adores a plan, this battle became all too familiar for, to me. For me, as a young Indian girl, I was conditioned into thinking that I needed to go to school, get a decent job, get married to a nice Indian man, have children, and that's life. I'm quite sure this is not unique to being Indian, but it was what I knew. Surprisingly, as I got older, the pressure lessened around me, and I separated myself from the Indian community a little more. Or maybe it was because they thought I was far too old for a woman in her early 30s. You're over the hill. Despite the lack of reinforcement from other aunties, a term for older Indian women, even if they are of no relation, the pressure remained within. I had become so conditioned, becoming my own critic, asking questions such as, why aren't you married yet? What's wrong with you? Instead of dealing with why I was asking myself these questions, I pushed aside that internal chatter by diverting my energy to focus on my work. Ignorance proved blessed because working was something I felt I could be in control of. I controlled my options, my work hours, my time, my energy and my application on projects. And I know now all this did was provide an unhealthy distraction. Instead of tackling my insecurities and lack from within, I delved into work because it would solidify my need to control outcomes by distracting myself from areas outside of my control. Work proved to be my attempt to control situations instead of confronting my internal resistance. Have you ever wanted something in life but you questioned it before you had it? We all do this to some degree. Take the following as an example. You suddenly become irritated and fed up with work. You see your friend post a picture of a beautiful holiday destination you consider looking into taking a break for yourself. You go online and search for this destination and find it is quite expensive. Suddenly you become annoyed that you may not be able to afford it until you notice an advert with an offer to another destination equally as stunning if not more. 
white sandy beaches, crystal blue water and sunshine highlighting its beauty. You delve into your search and become obsessed with this new destination until you experience some internal hesitation. Something you may not be aware of. A sense perhaps it is too good to be true. Nevertheless, you keep investigating and search for suitable dates. The dates on offer are not suitable for you. You decide you cannot possibly take the specific date off, sensing your boss would not grant it, despite having plenty of leave available. You convince yourself it would be a waste of money anyway, and that is better you do not blow your savings on some adventure when it is best to be more conservative. That money may come in handy in case of an emergency. You decide you will take a break over a weekend somewhere with a local friend. And that weekend never happened. All this elaborate flirting with potential joy, excitement and adventure peaked as quickly as it became diminished due to your internal conflict and reflective thinking, which regurgitated old patterns and familiar internal dialogue. This is not to say your hesitations are not valid, particularly when making a judgment call on your finances. This is just one example elucidating somebody going through one version of internal struggle and self-sabotaging. I know someone who did this in relationships. He would commit wholeheartedly to a relationship, move in with his partner, yet some years later it ended. He self-sabotaged his relationships when things got too much for him. Of course, all relationships are different, but many people are unaware they carry burdens and insecurities into their new relationship before dealing with problems from past relationships. The result of my friend's intervention, followed by recognizing myself in Gabrielle Bernstein's words, created an almost instant decision to live more in the present and critique myself less. My journey allowed me to tap into my newfound compassion and within it I understood my need to tackle a few difficult questions. Number one, how can I treat myself well? Number two, how can I be more compassionate and kinder to myself? Number three, what does this entail? Number four, what is the rationale behind self-sabotages? Number five, in what way do I sabotage myself? Number six, is there a pattern of self-sabotage? Number seven, what am I hiding from? Number eight, what am I afraid of? Number nine, what do I want? All of these were unheavily loaded questions. The important thing is not to feel pressure to come up with the answers right away. Many of those answers came to me during quiet moments of reflection or through meditation. Often, I would find answers while journaling. The answers evolved from weeks and months of focused attention and practice using various tools. And I began to understand we exert control over things we think we need to and can handle. Humans like being in control and it feels reassuring and we develop a sense of comfort and safety within this realm. I was all too familiar with my relationship bias because secretly I carried it with me, the need to keep people at bay. I felt fear that if anyone would become too close, I would end up being hurt. I would use countless excuses and became incredibly successful in pushing people away, including friends and potential partners, because this fear stemmed from within, and I perpetuated those results. That self-sabotage wasn't because of an absence of fruitful relationships. In fact, I had a wonderful example of what a loving and loyal relationship looked like because I grew up seeing my parents who provided me with an example of what a loving, loyal and committed relationship looked like. I encountered firsthand the ways they were affectionate and with one another, even if, as a teen, it was not always appreciated. Despite that, I developed personal hang-ups about feelings of being unworthy, about not being good enough, and eventually convinced myself that I didn't need it. Allowing fear, neglect and potential heartache prevented me from forming loving, meaningful relationships. It was another form of control and self-harm. I would control my work, my education and the achievements in my career to divert the potential to be happy in discovering fulfilling relationships. This way I could manage the risk versus reward and the outcome meant I couldn't get hurt by someone else. I wouldn't tell anyone how I felt. I was ashamed that I couldn't sustain a relationship. 
I would not allow myself to be judged or shamed by other people and give them the opportunity to ask the question I frequently asked myself. What's wrong with you? Thinking like this was when I fell into my personal black hole. Within it lay my insecurities such as not being worthy enough, beautiful enough, funny enough, or not being enough for love. It took a lot of focused internal analysis and listening to my truth to uncover those fears. I discovered it stemmed from a younger version of myself growing up with this internal fear. The fear of abandonment and being unlovable. As an adult, I made this my reality. Another penny dropped when Gabrielle spoke about listening to herself in her intuition to lessen the grip on control and focus on what is thriving instead. As a result, I refocused my attention and used my energy and effort on what was thriving instead of what was missing. For me, this meant opening my eyes towards the people I love, I was surrounded by. This entailed changing my perspective, particularly regarding the people within it. I needed to come to terms with my past, which I did by letting go, and release the hold and control regarding possible outcomes in my future. I finally accepted a lot was beyond my control and that isn't a bad thing. This reinforced the need to be present and grateful within the moment. God dreams bigger things for you than you ever could, unknown. Taking time to uncover the answers to the questions above took persistent effort. I needed to come to terms with my past and the situations I had been through before I could step into the type of person I wanted to be. I needed to let go of self-destructive habits, abusing food and exercise, as well as release the need to be in full control. Instead, I sought to lower the barriers I placed before my friends and when forming new relationships. I started to deal with other traumas from my childhood. I began to understand the calculated risks to increase my levels of happiness, and I began to accept my worth. The compassion I nurtured opened a pathway to being kinder, more loving, and more considerate to myself, and in turn, to others around me. I sought to be a better version of myself, benefiting my own well-being and that of others. Letting go of self-criticism from the past allowed me to come to terms with a woman I am today and see how everything I'd been through was purposeful. I began to nurture my intuition, to release the control I thought I needed to have on my future and allow myself to surrender to what is meant for me. I began to trust myself more and over time I realized the love I craved so badly needed to grow from within to cultivate and flourish love, appreciation and acceptance and remove self-criticism allowed me to appreciate all the things which encompassed the love that was already thriving in my present existence. What I did not know is how valuable treating myself meant. With that insight, things began to flow into moments that made life more beautiful. My awareness shifted and I could see love flourish everywhere because my attention and my attitude altered. Having confidence, compassion, empathy and showing kindness to yourself will allow you to be more of those things for others. You will extend more compassion and empathy towards those around you simply because you know you have it within you and you will extend it into the world. When we are kinder to ourselves it allows us to be kinder to others. Have you ever been told bullies are bullying because they are dealing with something themselves that maybe they are jealous of you in some way or maybe they are hurting so they want to hurt you? Think back to a time when you recognised somebody was in a bad mood and as a consequence they may have shown anger towards you. Their anger is their own struggle, inner conflict or hardship. If we know the individual we find we can excuse their behavior, but if we do not know them well, we can end up reflecting their current mood. A bad mood or angry comment can spread like a forest fire, particularly if it triggers something in you. Deflecting anger or a bad mood onto another person, such as a colleague, a friend, or even towards your partner is fairly common, and we end up resenting the other person for sharing their vexation. 
conversely, experiencing a smile from a stranger, enjoying a compliment or sharing a joke with someone connects us. It draws us closer and allows us to be vulnerable and happier. This is also a gift we can afford to share. When we are loving to ourselves, when we release any trauma or burdens, when we respect and value ourselves, we give the best version of ourselves to ourselves and then to others. Self-love took time. It took me at least 18 months to acknowledge what this feels like in addition to 20 plus years. Prior to this realization, Giving yourself love, compassion, consideration, and letting go of the inner critic, particularly when things aren't going the way you envision, means you can ease off the internal pressure you may be fighting within. You can also reduce the need to control the circumstance and its outcome. When we turn down the dial and reduce pressure of trying to control the outcome, we quieten our self-criticism and tap into the frequency of our intuition for signs or opportunities for more love and happiness to filter into our existence. These days, my intuition leads me to make the right decisions for the outcome I desire. At first, it was extremely hard to quieten the noise, the mindless chatter and internal dialogue, as it would often involved self-deprecation. But this is crucial when attempting to tap into your intuitive frequency. I realized that once I used meditation to quieten my thoughts, I exerted more self-compassion on myself, even during difficult practices. I also noticed more and more coincidences occurring in my life. Every time I asked for something, I would receive it. Over time, I learned that employing a non-attachment to the outcome was empowering. Whether you believe in God or are religious or not, whether you, whether or not you believe in a higher power or are spiritual, nothing is random or happens by chance. There are many kinds of probability, subjective probabilities, evidential probabilities and objective chances to name a few. We often describe something as random if it happens by chance. Science, scientists use chance or randomness to mean that when physical causes can result in any of the several outcomes, we cannot predict what the outcome will be in any particular case. Some philosophers are equally subjected to this elision, but others connect chance and randomness deliberately. It is also intuitively plausible that if an event is truly random, it cannot be explained. However, if it happens for a reason, it isn't truly random. The concept of order maintained by the law of cause and effect is a scientific principle traceable through Hebrew, Babylonian, Greek, and modern civilization. The law of cause and effect explains that every thought of intention and action, an emotion transmitting from you as a person sets into emotion an unseen chain of effects which vibrates into the entire cellular structure within the environment, thus into the cosmos. Eventually, the vibrational energy returns to the original source upon the swing of a pendulum. With the knowledge of this and evidence from coincidences, this underpinned my sense of power in something bigger than myself. I began to understand that there was a greater universal truth and within that I was able to tap into this higher realm and alternate dimensions. This of course gave me a greater sense of empowerment because moments when I felt lost or unable to see the bigger picture from turbulence I faced personally or at work, I began to think outside my small existence and felt that there was more happening that I wasn't aware of. I can only describe this as feeling assured that I drew comfort in knowing there was something bigger at play, but something that I can contribute towards writing my own destiny. It gave me a sense of self-assurance and enabled me to delve deeper, seek confidence within my intuition and navigate towards being true to what my purpose was within this life. This was a light bulb moment, which I still value to this day. It meant I could loosen my grip on controlling the way I wanted my life to go by accepting what it is I am here to do alongside the realization that during that journey, things will arise that are purposefully connected to that goal. I borrowed this from Gabrielle's talk when she asked for guidance. She sought to let go of her control and allow for the things that were supposed to be, be. Even to this day, I use this prayer 
I speak it into the cosmos when I ask for guidance to align me to my true purpose in life. Dear universe, what would you have me do? Where would you have me go? What would you have me say and to whom? By Gabrielle Bernstein. This small yet powerful prayer, or call it guidance if you prefer, served my higher purpose into understanding why I am here on earth. It allowed me to relinquish the control so I desperately hold, held on to. It enabled me to let go of the tight grip in wanting or needing to control every aspect of my life. It facilitated me to give up the attachment to the outcome and goal of where I think I need to be and gave me the freedom in faith towards the unknown. It has also given me faith in asking for my purpose. Whilst I am a spiritual being experiencing human existence on this earth, it has given me faith on days when I need additional support and guidance towards making the right choices or simply to stop forcing an outcome and allow greater opportunities to flow to me. And they did. There were often times where I would ask for help and announce this prayer into the world and the universe at large when I openly allowed and accepted the lessons it brought me that day. This prayer always gave me the level of certainty I needed because I was able to let go of the feeling of being in control. I was able to place the control outside of myself without the burden I placed within myself. It gave me confidence knowing that whatever situation arose, including hardships, I accepted the lesson and trust it would pass. And I would no longer linger on why it happened or ruminate over what was. On those days when I recited it, I found it led me to opportunities and circumstances that accelerated my journey into self-realization. It was also allowing me to be grateful for the day and all the new lessons that came within it. Mere coincidences were not just coincidences anymore and thoughts of seeking out support and then speaking to people who could help me on my personal and professional journey all came about at the right time. When I succumbed to that particular moment in time, when I allowed the moment to play out as it was, I was in a state of allowance. It was then I received the guidance I needed. I began to use this feeling of release and remained open to opportunities, which also led me to increase my intuition. When something didn't feel right and I didn't know what to do, I'd ask for guidance and allow the answers to arrive instead of pushing towards what can be an unfavorable outcome through sheer force. When that happened, it allowed me to understand what I needed to work through. It was showing me the internal resistance I held onto and how much I was replaying my old habits of self-sabotage where I sought to control the outcome. It was in that negative, desperate state when things I desired would often be pushed further away. Throughout this journey, I realized the need to be patient, release the rigid expectations of a specific outcome desired, and be open to new opportunities, adventures, and circumstances. If I let go of control, I wouldn't be disappointed, but instead would be open to the probability of something better coming along. I was increasing the sense of probability that nothing was at random, everything was for a reason, even if I didn't know what that reason was at the time. As a result of releasing expectations and control, the things I once wrote in my journal or described on my vision board started to become a reality. Things to consider. What are you afraid of? This answer can only come from a place of truth. You must be completely honest with yourself for this, to be a breakthrough moment. Don't be afraid to ask yourself this question numerous times. Eliminate the need to change. Simply observe your patterns, habits, and things that you have been through and why you are afraid. The key is to change nothing, but simply accept what you are feeling. What are you attempting to control? We may want to form a tight grip over the things we want, but this often leads to higher expectations when they do not work out as we wanted and therefore leads us to feel disappointment. Instead of placing the happiness on the outcome, place awareness on what it is you are attempting to control and why. 
Why do you have this need to control the situation and what are your expectations of them? Did these expectations stem from things you were afraid of? Remember to be compassionate with yourself, practice self-love and patience. Many things may arise in the present that you had not previously considered. Where did those feelings stem from? What other feelings do you associate with this? What is it you can do right now to accept the circumstance or are you able to accept them for what they are? Unless you can change the circumstance, it may prove beneficial to divert your attention away from it. If this is something you want or have desired, give it some time. Sit with a feeling, allow inspiration to strike you, to make a move. And if it does not feel right, learn to trust your instincts. Let it go and wait to see what happens next. Letting go does not mean giving up. It means you are releasing it from your attention and doing other things while you wait for what it is you truly meant for you to arrive. Having patience for things to unfold can be scary, but learning to sit back and not interfere is also a great tool to use when pursuing something great. Thank you so much for listening to my chapter one on happiness within a journey of reflection and self-discovery. Please let me know if you enjoyed this chapter and coming up soon, I've got chapter two to look forward to reading to you. I hope you enjoyed this one. I will speak with you soon.